Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Great to meet you. My name is Adam. I have with me Liam. We're from Tetrate, and we're super excited to be able to talk on this topic of how we can turn our cloud native applications inside out using a service mesh. So as by way of introduction, um, I'm part of our solution engineering organization at Tetrate, really a longtime proponent and contributor to um, open source, very active in the Cloud Foundry, Spring, and uh, Kubernetes ecosystems. And I have, like I said, Liam with me. I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, yes, I'm Liam. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Tetrate. Um, I lead the cloud team. Um, so, and I'm also an Istio maintainer. So I'm a rare combination of Istio maintainer and user. Uh, so that provides some interesting insight. Great. So what we're going to cover today is first a little bit of a, a history or what we kind of view as the common patterns and building blocks that are used for building cloud native applications, specifically using the Spring ecosystem and Spring Cloud and some of the IP that Netflix contributed to the open source. Then we're going to cover how does service mesh fit in with this type of architecture and this type of approach with uh, Java applications. Then lastly, we'll walk through a little bit of a migration example of how we go from potentially using some of these Netflix libraries to introducing service mesh into the app. Now we're gonna go through a couple of code examples, architecture examples pretty quickly, but you'll notice there is a link to a GitHub repo that actually has the before and after code that y'all can uh, take a look at and maybe even try and run and use as, as an example. So as we start out, I definitely wanna preface this whole presentation with Tetrate, myself, we all heart Spring and Spring Cloud. So the takeaway from this should not be abandon Spring Cloud or abandon Spring and go a different route, use Service Mesh as a completely new alternative. The point is to show you how this can augment and support uh, your Spring and your Spring Boot applications, potentially unlocking some new capabilities that maybe uh, you don't have today and maybe making a few things a little bit easier for you, your developers and your operators of your cloud platforms. So how do we get to this point where looking at the end of the timeline, uh, where we are in 2020 or now 2021, um, in what I see as most organizations looking at, how do I build microservice or cloud native applications and then uh, spread them across clusters and across multiple clouds? Well, we arrived, we've arrived at this point because there's been a, a number of very important and interesting uh, contributions to the open source and technologies that make building cloud native applications and microservices a little bit easier. It goes all the way back to 2012 when Netflix realized they need to build smaller services, iterate over them quickly, optimize for velocity, and then begin to be very vocal about the patterns of technologies and the ways they did this and even open sourced many of these libraries. Supporting this, there is the emergence of Docker and containers, container scheduling platforms like Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry. Then we really saw the standard or the buzzword of microservices being the way to go for building applications. Now around this 2014 timeline, the Spring community made it very, very easy to start to build these types of applications with Spring Boot and then later Spring Cloud, which uh, embodies and, and releases some of these Netflix contributions in the way Spring developers have known to grow and love with uh, convention over configuration, uh, an opinionated out of the box configuration that gets you started really quickly. And then a few years later, Istio was um, open sourced and released to 1.0. And we'll talk about why that's important when it comes to cloud native applications. Now the ingredients or why do we actually do this is the fundamental thing when we move to microservices or cloud native or just smaller units of work is we end up in the situation where everything we depend on or anyone that depends on us begins to communicate with us over the network. And this is uh, especially problematic if either the network or we could say more broadly, the compute, the cloud, the infrastructure that we're running on becomes more dynamic, um, more maybe somewhat less resilient in the terms of one individual unit of commute, uh, compute. And so we don't wanna lose any resilience. If you take the example of an application, like let's say it depends on 30 different microservices to build a complete experience for an end user. If each of those uh, services has an uptime of four nines, and then we multiply that though across 30 services, the overall experience is only slightly above two nines of availability. And that's if every single service meets its objective or SLA. So that's why I love this description of 
one of my friends and former coworkers, uh, Duncan Wynn, who he describes cloud native as this uh, way we build software that's designed to run and scale reliably and predictably on, on top of unreliable cloud-based infrastructure. Or we could also say uh, dynamic cloud-based infrastructure. So that leads us to begin to build into our application. And since we're talking about Spring applications and Java applications, built right into our JVM, uh, patterns around how do I discover the services I need? How do I load balance across them? How do I do that in a resilient way? And how do I fail fast when there's problems that are taking place? Then how do I get visibility into what is taking place with metrics and telemetry, and then trace calls to service, to service, to service. And that's really what is needed to begin to uh, build cloud native applications that are going to be spread across multiple clusters, multiple clouds, uh, multiple Kubernetes environments. And so how would we actually do this in practice? Well, here's a little uh, super simple snippet of code. If I were building an application, application like this, I'd go to start.spring.io, which really helps me get started building, including the dependencies in either my Maven or Gradle uh, build system to define my application. And then with just a couple of annotations, I can indicate that this application, which is uh, modeling a to-dos application, is going to have some circuit breaking um, capabilities within it, unable to wire together a REST template, which is making uh, calls over the network and a load balance across endpoints that are going to be under the covers are resolved using some sort of service discovery mechanism. And as you see from my URL to my dependent service, which is called to-dos Redis, it's able to resolve that to the endpoints uh, transparently to my application. And then lastly, I'm able to give it a couple annotations so that when things maybe get slow, I can fail fast, or when things back up, I cannot have a cascading failure with my application. So if we lay that across how we actually deploy it uh, across maybe a Kubernetes cluster, I'll point out a couple um, common uh, ingredients that we might have. In, in our architecture here. Uh, first, we probably get traffic into our applications using a standard Kubernetes ingress controller. And that typically will land at a Spring Cloud Gateway, which then knows how to talk with Eureka, our service registry, find out where our web UI is, where our API service is. Uh, also, our API service is gonna talk with that registry to both register where it's running and then how it finds its dependencies. And then lastly, since almost every application I see in the wild today is uh, running across multiple clusters, this Eureka instance is probably going to be peering with other Eurekas in other uh, clusters to provide service discovery for either replicas of that same application or its dependent services. So this is a pretty standard architecture, but there's a couple of gaps or challenges uh, that arise with this. First, this is really optimized for the JVM or for Java applications because these libraries to solve these problems are built right into the application. So the polyglot experience is really less than ideal if you're writing or want to build a service in something other than Java. Secondly, since it is in the application, you have a very tight coupling with solving these uh, cloud uh, patterns or these cloud challenges. I'd even call them network or platform challenges that's coupled right with your code right with the art artifact that you're going to deploy, whether it's the jar or you could say more broadly, the container you're shipping. And then lastly, usually some of these semantics of how to solve these problems end up creeping into your CD processes. And this is going to add overall complexity because you have platform and infrastructure level uh, concerns being solved right next to your business logic. And then these, these patterns don't have the most robust semantics and primitives for multi-cluster definitions, multi-cloud definitions. It becomes kind of hard to say, if you're running right next to me, here's how you can discover me. But if you're not running in my cluster, you should discover me a different way. It gets complex really quickly uh, using these patterns. And then lastly, there's a certain set of applications that this just won't be applicable for. If you can't rewrite your application or at least uh, modify it enough to include these libraries, it won't be able to participate. And then commercial off the shelf software certainly won't be able to uh, run in this manner. And so that's where the importance of a transparent layer that solves some of these concerns comes in, uh, a transparent network layer, which uh, now my colleague, colleague Liam is going to talk about how Service Mesh can bring that to the table. All right, so transparent network layer. So if you go and look at the Envoy docs, um, you'll see one of the like, core tenants of the project is that the network should be transparent to applications. And when network and application problems do occur, it should be easy to determine the source of the problem. There are two parts to this, obviously. There is the transparency. So what this means 
It's the application shouldn't be aware or even care that it's part of a service mesh, right? And by extension, this includes developers. If I'm a developer, my job is to produce business value. I shouldn't have to care about mutual TLS. It should just be done for me. Um, I might care about retries or timeouts, right? Um, but beyond that, because that's maybe application specific, beyond that, I don't care. I just want to solve business problems. And the second part is about visibility. And because Envoy is you know, a TCP and UDP proxy with, uh, with an understanding of how to deal with HTTP2 and HTTP3 for quick, um, it knows everything about network communications, about the network communication between your services. And it can use this information to make visible uh, to everyone what's happening within your, uh, across your, within and across your clusters. So how does it solve this problem? Um, we well, can see there on the left, we've got the Netflix OSS model where you know, uh, it, we bundle in discovery, uh, load balancing, so tra traffic management, resiliency metrics, tracing into the uh, service itself as a library. When we are using Kubernetes and Envoy, we uh, extract that we extract that functionality out into Envoy itself, um, and Envoy runs uh, as a separate process uh, alongside uh, alongside your service in a different container. In Kubernetes, well, it's in a in the same pod but in a different container. Um, but the key is that it's a separate process. Um, so, what does the request flow look like? Well, uh, request comes into a pod. Uh, it gets intercepted by Envoy, it gets forwarded on to the service. The service, when it makes uh, outward requests, goes in the reverse direction. Um, so like I mentioned in the previous section, it's separate container, same pod. Uh, they share a network namespace in Kubernetes. Um, so we can do all kind of messing around with IP tables. And that's how we do it transparently in Istio. Next slide. So Envoy refers to this um, as uh, an out-of-process architecture. And what this really means is moving the logic from the libraries within the code um, out to a separate binary that can run as a separate process, separate container. Technically, those two things are the same thing in Kubernetes <laughs> and in Docker, um, but within the same pod. And doing this has quite a few benefits. So moving this out means that it works with any language. So it works, like I mentioned, at the network level, it speaks TCP or UDP. You might have some crazy protocol, but you can extend Envoy to actually speak that protocol uh, if you can write something that compiles down to WASA. Um, if you're a purely Java shop, then this might not be much of an advantage. However, the next one is, which is it allows it to work with any legacy and third-party applications. So you have Postgres, you have Redis, you have um, some legacy system running on a mainframe that you're never... <laughs> that you don't want to touch. Um, we just deploy either Envoy alongside it, or if you're deploying on a mainframe, maybe you deploy it as an egress gateway on the way out to the mainframe, right? Um, and then we see, then we have that visibility and control of the traffic in the same way that you would a modern cloud native application. The next advantage is that um, upgrades of libraries are painful. Right. In a containerized world, you have to recompile all your images or rebuild all your images, probably not compile them. And then you have to make sure each of these deployed. Sometimes this requires coordinating with dev teams, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but if we decouple, uh, decouple this functionality so that the platform team can just roll out security fixes and roll out new versions of Envoy, for instance, uh, application devs need to be none the wiser. Right? And again, they can just focus on actually uh, writing the core business logic. The other advantage of this uh, separation is if we are if we're uh, if we're using an Envoy based service mesh, nearly pretty much all of them are API driven, much like Kubernetes is. So in a similar way to uh, if you uh, needed to scale out capacity, you needed to increase the number of replicas uh, for a specific uh, deployment. Um, because you're pinning your CPU, uh, you can just scale it up via an API change. You don't have to kind of like change anything else. You just change that one thing. And we can do that using a uh, number based service mesh as well, right? Like maybe uh, you're something slow and it's taking 11 seconds to respond and you have a 10 second retry, right? You can just make a single config change um, to an API and that, auto that can automatically increase your timeout um, so that you're no longer having an outage, you're just extremely slow. And extremely slow is better, usually better 
<laughs> usually, usually better than uh, no request. Now, um, there is obviously one disadvantage, which is relatively obvious from an out of process architecture, and that's latency, right? So moving out of process means that uh, when you're making a request, you're now going through the network stack within the kernel, uh, within the kernel and user space. Uh, you're going in and out of it an extra one, two, four times, right? Um, and this, like, it legitimately does increase, except for some circumstances, it legitimately does increase latency. That I have seen examples like if the Python's TLS implementation is basically uh, less efficient than using Envoy. So if you're doing TLS in Python <laughs> and you move it to Envoy, sometimes you can see a speed up, but generally you will see an increase in latency. So this is an issue. If your workloads have strict latency requirements, then G the gRPC team is currently working on implementing uh, the Envoy APIs. So on latency specific paths, you can choose to use gRPC. You won't have to do the uh, kernel user space network stack uh, jumps. You just kind of do the thing. Uh, I think as well, uh, Cilium maybe have some stuff <laughs> that does a, it basically prevents you from needing to go through uh, from user space into the kernel and back out again when you're doing this network hop, uh, but you need to speak to them more about that. I don't fully, <laughs> I haven't been paying too much attention to what they've been doing, but I believe they offer some uh, stuff specifically for Envoy. Next slide. So moving this out of process gives us uh, consistency. This kind of breaks down into four things. First one being traffic management. So it doesn't matter if it's the third party application, Postgres, Redis, legacy application, uh, homegrown non-Java application, right? You get this, you use the same API to configure all of the traffic management. It doesn't matter kind of but it doesn't matter about any of those things. So this functionality includes like retries, circuit breaking, request shadowing, session stickiness, locali uh, locality load balancing. So keeping keeping your AWS or other cloud provider network cost down by keeping your traffic all within the same AZ where possible. Um, canarying, AB test and fault injection, whatever, whatever uh, functionality that Envoy you need to leverage, it's the same API for configuring all of those things. It's also the same API for configuring uh, security and policy, right? So third party, whatever, it doesn't matter. Same API. Um, if you're using Istio, we leverage Envoy's SDS, so, so uh, secret discovery service, um, and we allow you to incrementally adopt MTLS everywhere. Um, we handle certificate rotation for you. We assure identities based on hours or days, um, not weeks or months. And we do this because certificate revocation is extremely painful. Um, so we just have short-lived certificates. Um, and yeah, it's a con we have this consistent way of uh, writing policy for all of, uh, all of your applications. The next one is behavior. So the if you have a bunch of implementations of different client libraries, so you might have a Java library that does retries, a Go library that does retries, um, maybe, uh, I don't know, Postgres, uh, Postgres has its own thing, but maybe you have a legacy application that doesn't really do timeouts or something or retries, right, whatever. Um, the behavior is going to be different across all of the implementations or it might not be there at all, right? And because we have the same binary everywhere, save the gRPC stuff we mentioned earlier, um, we get consistent, uh, but more importantly, predictable behavior. And uh, predictable behavior is uh, always better. Uh, not only that, we can move, you know, uh, like Adam mentioned, we can put the, uh, we can put Envoy at the ingress gateway. So um, we have that consistency there. And the same goes for telemetry, right? Because Envoy produces the same metrics across the same protocol, regardless of, you know, third party, uh, your own application, right? We're going to have the same metrics. We're going to have the same metrics names. We aren't going to have to coordinate metric names across teams. They just get given <laughs> metrics names. Um, so we can just generate dashboards like by usually via code, by templating, right? Like because the names are always the same um, and the uh, attributes are always the same, um, we just get kind of, we can just auto generate all of that stuff. Okay. Great. So let's, let's um, now take a look at how we could apply some of these things that Liam just mentioned in our same application. And again, 
Uh, we're going to go through a couple examples pretty quickly on how we can enable mesh capabilities around ingress, service discovery, um, client side load balancing, some resiliency capabilities and security. Uh, grab the actual code examples from our uh, GearHead repo so you can see them working for yourself. Now, with this updated architecture, there's some obvious changes that we've made. The client libraries are no longer in the Spring Boot application. We now have an Envoy instance that's paired up with every single um, application container that's running in Kubernetes. Secondly, our, our Kubernetes ingress has changed. We're able to actually use Envoy itself as an ingress gateway and have some of these capabilities that we're talking about at the furthest edge ingress of our cluster. And then lastly, the thing you'll notice is our service registry actually has disappeared. So inherently within whatever control plane we're using to program Istio, it's able to uh, give information about where services are running, endpoints, and, and provide that service discovery capabilities inherently into the platform. So let's talk about this first item, server ingress and service discovery. So in our Spring Boot application, there's a couple changes that we simply can remove and drop stuff out of our application. Optionally, we could remove the gateway. Now that's not a hard requirement. There might be certain use cases where you leave your Spring Cloud gateway uh, in, the mech, in the mix, but optionally that could be uh, removed. Secondly, we'll strip out our Eureka dependencies and then any code that's been annotated with load balancing, uh, discovery client and or, or any of those related uh, constructs can be removed. And then lastly, as I mentioned in the previous slide, our, our Eureka reg registry can be completely retired. Now I'm gonna show you a couple of code snippets that are a little bit more how you would program this imagine, imagining that Istio is your control plane, but ultimately this gets materialized into Envoy configuration to actually program the data path. Um, and so any, any control plane that's programming Envoy typically would behave about the same, even though the semantics might be slightly different. So if we're utilizing uh, Envoy as our ingress gateway, we simply need to tell uh, our our ingress and then program our Envoy instances where it can route traffic to. So it's a very simple definition of my traffic's coming in to my uh, Redis prefix at my endpoint, send that to my Redis de destination in my cluster. My code, I mentioned on the left, there's a bunch of stuff that's uh, extracted out of your Java code. Nothing needs to be added. So I can still refer to my service, my to-dos dash Redis service on port 8080. And if you actually look at what's manifested itself in Envoy, we can ask Envoy what routes do you know how to send traffic to, what endpoints exist for those routes, and it would report back to us why no to do's Redis exists, and here is the actual uh, internal Kubernetes IPs that I could send traffic to, or if it's going across, clus across cluster, it might be an externally routable uh, IP. So going part and parcel with that service discovery and initial load balancing or initial ingress, is actual more full-scale client-side load balancing. So if we haven't already done so, we can strip out of our Java code, out of our, out of our application, those load balance or discovery client uh, annotations. Potentially, if we've done something more sophisticated, uh, like provide a custom implementation for the ribbon load balancers or a, a more sophisticated algorithm or configuration for that, that also can drop out off. And now we can program our envoys of how we want to shape traffic. So I have three very simple examples here of how we can split traffic across uh, multiple instances. In this case, it's sending 95% of our traffic to our original version of our cache service. 5% will go to our new version uh, using application labels under the covers. And then we're giving it a little bit of information when things might misbehave. At half a second timeout, uh, retry three times, and what are the type of scenarios we should ret retry on? We also can tell Envoy what is going to be the actual load balancing strategy, the traffic policy that's going to be applied when we establish these connections. And then lastly, you know, one really interesting thing uh, we can do since we're controlling all traffic, we can actually uh, control how we connect to things outside of uh, our service mesh or even outside of our Kubernetes clusters and have that do things like TLS mutual authentication. And when, we, when, I, when I get to a little bit of a security uh, slide, I'll talk why that's pretty significant and important for our applications. Now we also uh, want to make sure our applications are resilient, things are ejected from our client side load balancers as, as needed. And so in our application, we can drop out uh, any Hystrix or Spring Cloud circuit breaker dependencies that are in our uh, greater build or Maven Palm files. 
remove all the annotations that are related to that. And then if we have implemented any circuit breaker factories or potentially we're using the more modern resilience for J, we can remove the config, the properties, the annotations that we've placed on our methods re regarding that. But then we can tell any Redis or excuse me, any Envoy sidecar how it should behave when it connects. So in this example, uh, we're fictitiously saying my API service is connecting to uh, four pods of my cache service. One of them is misbehaving. Well, we're able to configure it so that um, it can only do 10 connections at once. It's going to time out after five seconds. And what are the ways or how should we eject endpoints when they don't behave correctly? So in this configuration, we're saying in any 10 second window, if we have 10 five OX errors, we should eject that endpoint for a minute. And obviously there's more robust and verbose configurations that we can made for, make for this, but very easy to transparently interject this into how our traffic's flowing through the system. Now as a little bit of extra credit, I'll talk about some security items because that's one uh, inherent capability that this transparent networking layer, the service mesh gives to us. So within our application, we can strip out any of the complex trust store, key store stuff that we may have had to do in our JVM. Uh, we can connect to services just simply over TLS and rely on the service mesh to and, and our, our Envoy sidecars to handle all the security for inbound and outbound. So in this example, let's say we only want our caching service to be talked to by the API service. Things closer to the edge, like our web UI or our uh, ingress, shouldn't directly uh, connect to that. So we're very easily able to author policy that says for all traffic, MP MTLS is going to be strictly enforced. And we're also going to inspect that certificate that's presented by the client. And we're going to only allow principles identified by the to-do's API certificate to connect. And so that's the certificate, an X509 certificate that's issued to every single Envoy uh, sidecar to our application that's going to have a unique identity so we can author both auth N and auth Z policy that looks like this. So this is controlling service to service uh, communication and the security aspect of it, but we can also control the request level uh, security. So this varies very, very widely of how we would implement this in our application using Spring Security. So I'm not going to cover what we might be able to remove from our application. That could probably be a 30 minute talk on itself. But within the actual service mesh, we can author policy that is going to uh, validate tokens. And so in this case, it's going to be talking to Keycloak, inspecting the JWT um, tokens that are going to be presented by uh, the request, both validate that that token is valid and was issued from our identity provider. And then in this example, we're looking at all the claims that are associated with it to make sure that the user invoking our service has the to-do's user role. So we're able to not only identify uh, what is the service to service communication and control that traffic at a very fine grain level, but also the end user who is uh, invoking our service and propagate that throughout our service mesh and enforce that uh, using Envoy as a policy enforcement point. So to wrap this up or to kind of summarize what is this new architecture that, that we have with service mesh and Spring, Spring can still bring to the table uh, the very easy way to get started and build microservice applications with uh, Spring Boot and all the libraries that make consuming data services, messaging services, uh, reactive patterns, building UIs, all the things that Spring does are great can be built into your application. We can decouple the common cloud native patterns out of our application to simplify the architecture. We can have that platform provided for us. And so that's going to unlock and simplify anytime we wanna take a polyglot approach and introduce non-Java, um, uh, services into our application architecture. Then it also will greatly simplify once we begin to span multiple Kubernetes clusters, multiple cloud environments or multiple cloud providers themselves. And the semantics for uh, expressing that to our applications are much, much easier. And then this also unlocks the opportunity to begin to introduce non-cloud native applications into our cloud native architecture. And then lastly, as we saw in kind of the extra credit portion, we can very easily consistently and transparently enable all of our applications by default with some pretty sophisticated and advanced security primitives to uh, move us towards uh, initiatives like zero trust architecture within our applications. So service mesh, uh, Envoy, 
that's really like a peanut butter and chocolate with a spring. You put them together, you're gonna to get a really great recipe. So thanks for your attention with that. Now I think we have just a few minutes for questions uh, to answer.